Good morning, everyone. And uh, we're going to begin uh, this study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have uh, this morning. As we open your word together, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and strengthen our intellect. And that the light that shines upon us can be received and understood and shared with others. We ask, Lord, that you can help this movement as we seek uh, unity with one another. We ask, Lord, that um, your character can be manifest in us. That we can have the meekness and lowliness of Christ. Be with us now as we study together. May your Holy Spirit be present in our hearts. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. So here is what we did yesterday. And this is, of course, tentative. I added it a little bit here. So um, I put for the Oklahoma camp meeting in 2010, I put the first day I met Jeff. That's going to be November 7th. That was Jeff's birthday. So in 2010, that would have been his uh, 58th birthday, 59th, right? So 59th birthday. Does that make sense? Yeah, 59th. Yeah, because he turned. Yeah, it's 59th. Yeah, so his 59th birthday is when I met him. Nobody mentioned it was his birthday or anything. And, of course, I met Kathy. She was there. Um. And they set up uh, their books. And one of the things that impressed me about Jeff is even though he obviously was the most important person there as far, as far as the message was concerned, uh, he definitely didn't act like it. Uh, there was a lot of other speakers who acted like they were important, uh, but Jeff wasn't one of them. Uh, so he was a very humble guy. And uh, so I was pretty impressed when I met him and his wife. Um, and not so impressed with some of the other people. There's some people that I liked as speakers. I liked Emiliano's style. It was fast-paced and, and interesting. Um, and I liked Dario Taylor. I liked his personality. He was even-keeled and seemed like a very pleasant guy. But lots of the other speakers seemed to be full of themselves. But that was just my opinion. I, you know could be just personality differences but <clears throat> but that's how I perceived it at the time and and it was also interesting in Oklahoma because it was at the Lifestyle Center, Center of America that was I know Neil Nedley had a part in that in building this luxury hotel in uh, Oklahoma in kind of a semi-desert area um, and uh, there was a wide variety of people. So I'd been to different independent camp meetings, uh, you know, mostly in Washington, uh, Light Bears, and uh, actually ran a couple of independent camp meetings of my own. And what you generally tended to get was very conservative Adventists, um, sort of all from the same uh, group of people, mostly marginal whites, if you're going to use a sociological description of them um, and uh, you know usually a few wealthy people uh, but this camp meeting was very diverse very diverse types of people that were there all these different ministries um, and it was a, a pretty active uh, camp meeting as far as the types of discussions that went on now I, I didn't sleep much so I you know I woke up usually like one or two in the morning and uh, uh, would uh, pray and study and get ready for uh, doing scripture songs to all the different meetings that were done. So there was a lot of meetings. I sang a lot of scripture songs. But, uh, but that was my first encounter, really, with the movement. Um, I mean, somebody had contacted me on Facebook and invited me and paid my way to go there. So, um, you know, if it wasn't for that, I don't know 
what would have happened. I mean, obviously God has a million different ways to do things, but uh, so for me, it was pretty important. Right. So I'm saying, you know, from a personal point of view, a lot of these things are um, personal, not so much the ozone camp meeting, but definitely the Oklahoma camp meeting, which we mark here as two different uh, way marks. And that would be a parallel in a sense to 9-11 in that aspect, the empowerment of a, me of a message and uh, the arrival of a message. Now, when we look at a line like this and we think about the bigger lines, um, you know, it, sometimes people look at something like 9-11. They say, well, that's, you know, the empowerment of the first angel and it's the arrival of the second. And it's a pretty major event. Now, in some ways, the Oklahoma camp meeting is. The prophetic chain was a pretty major landmark camp meeting in this movement. Now, ozone in 2004, that's ozone, Arkansas. Um, and that was the first camp meeting they ever had in Arkansas, not, not necessarily uh, because Jeff talks about the one that happened in 2014 on June 22nd. Um, and, uh, but, you know, that's just a different place, right? So when he's talking about Arkansas in, in 2014, that's when they've established their own place. And if that and that one's going to be in 2014 uh, at Lambert Church. So they they haven't built up the School of the Prophets yet. They just had started doing that. Um, but they had the camp meeting at the Lambert Church uh, in, in June 22nd, and then they had the camp the meeting in 2014. And in 2014, Heidi and I were at the fall camp meeting. And that's the one that uh, I presented um, the chronology, right? So some of the basic structures. And I was looking at that, that paper. I mean, I was just developing um, the early part of the chronology, so I hadn't really figured out some things. Um, but I had figured out the period of the kings, which was, to me, the most important part at that time. Uh, but I hadn't figured out the chronology all the way back to the flood. I was experimenting with uh, different ways of trying to add up these ages of the patriarchs, taking into account that, um, you know, it could be, you could add six months or take six months off. I finally figured out that actually the Bible is written in such a way that you can use them as a total. That is, the Bible already averages the ages of the patriarchs. So when it says somebody lived to be 130, um, that's that sort of centering it. I mean, they might have been 129 and a half, or they might have been 130 and a half, but they're going to put it to 130. And this is so that all of the totals um, add up, because if you didn't take that into account, you know, like if, for instance, my grandfather had my dad when he was 20, and then my dad had me when he was 20. And then I had my son when I was 20. If that happened, um, you, you would say, well, you just add 20 up and you're going to get, you know, how many years from the first to the last one being born. But it doesn't work that way because on average, you're going to be 20 and a half when you're 20. Right. So so the Bible's written in such a way that those totals work out that you can just add them. So they're going to already adjust the ages of the patriarchs. So I know that that seems, unless, you know, everybody's born on, on their dad's birthday, right? Which, which is yeah. highly unlikely, right? So, so that was things that I was dealing with um, in October of 2014 when I presented. I hadn't dealt with that yet. I was experimenting. Later, I came to understand that they were meant to be total together. And that became really useful, too, in understanding the, the chronology of the kings of Judah. So I, I know this is a little bit of diversion from this. But when you look at the chronology of the kings of Judah, um, one of the things that chronologists assume is it says, 
that a king reigned so many years. So let's say you have Jehoiakim uh, and Josiah, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, uh, Zedekiah, um, and and you have you know you have these these kings in the line of Judah. They're meant to be totaled. That you, is, you add them up. That is, um, for instance, Jehoiakim. It says he reigns for 11 years. And the same is said of Zedekiah. Now, we're going to have, uh, if you look at the chronology that I have, I'm not going to show it to you right now, but if you look at the chronology that I have, I actually have Jehoiakim dying in his 12th year of reign. And yet, the Bible says that he reigned 11 years. And so what chronologists assume is that when it says he reigned 11 years, he must have died in his 11th year. But this is an assumption that they made, and this is something that I had to abandon. But I came to realize in working out the chronology of the kings that all you had to do was total them together. The only exception is the co-regency uh, that happens with, um, I can't think of his name right now. Stephen would remember, but he's not here. So um, but there's one co-regency, and that's going to be with uh, Jehoshaphat. I can't remember. And Joram, something like that. Anyway, there's a two-year co-regency, which you have to discern by comparing it to the kings of Israel. But otherwise, if you just added up all of the kings of Judah, they would add up to 393 years and six months. If you just took the years that they were, are said to reign. But there is this two-year co-regency, and so it's 391 years and six months and 10 days, if we if we take that, uh, that total. So anyway, that's you know, really an aside here. So when we look at this line now, so we've, we've put these events here and we've, we've marked them as an arrival of a message. And that is, we have to define what this darkness is to understand what this line is about. So this is the line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar put together as being the first, second, and third angels' messages. Now, Heidi and I talked about it a little bit. We, we really think that we need to actually draw the line of Othniel and the line of Ehud and the line of Shamgar uh, as individual lines as well. That is, we know that if we zoom into a waymark that we can create a, a line. So, um, but let's just talk about this line first. So what is the darkness again that we have that we need this line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. This message that's going to arrive at 9-11. Anybody know what the... How we define the darkness. Well, we can see that this line addresses our movement, right? So it's a reform line for this movement. And what is the darkness that this movement has at 9-11? that a message arrives. So Othniel represents what? The work of what? I'm sure you people are there. I see your names. The work of God's spirit. 
Okay. I mean, I'm looking so, at Judges 2 and 3, and all, all I can refer to is what I'm reading there. Like, I, I didn't come into the movement until about 2015, so. And <laughs> yeah. retention powers are not the greatest. Yeah, okay. So this is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what we have decided Othniel is. Now, Othniel, if we took Othniel as an individual line, we would see that it's going to represent uh, specifically a work that's needed of repentance. But, you know, it's a particular type of repentance because a repentance is addressing something that's the darkness. Now, part of the problem that I see in Adventism that, that existed prior to 9-11, so as being an Adventist um, through the 80s and 90s, um, when 9-11 came about, um, we know that for the church, uh, the prophetic message had really disappeared. And what we had as a prophetic message, um, you know, focused upon the Sunday law, if anybody was interested in the Sunday law, they, you know, in, in prophecy, they were going to be talking about the Sunday law. But generally, it would be about, um, within conservative Adventism, it was about the sin within the church itself. The problem that the problems that were in the church, and in some ways, this movement arose out of that dissatisfaction with the church, the direction the church was going. And but we were all Seventh Day Adventists. And you didn't see a lot of people in that period of time who there were some. I mean, I know groups groups that were much more highly critical of the church to the point that they would call the church Babylon. Um, but they were definitely marginalized for the most part. Um, most conservative Adventists were still in the church trying to reform the church and, and pointing out the church's sins. But one thing that, in my experience, is that the people who were doing this were themselves unconverted but just not aware of it. Now, there was the message of Jones and Wagner that was uh, being promoted through the 80s and into the 90s, um, especially the message on the nature of Christ. So that was a really popular topic and overcoming sin, righteousness by faith. And that's mostly what I preached all through uh, that history um, in the 80s and 90s. And, and and basically that was my message until I got into this movement. I was a Jones and Wagner righteousness by faith guy. Um, and but but I was a little bit different than a lot of the other groups uh, that were around in how I looked at the nature of Christ and how I understood righteousness by faith. So um, which is what we're studying on Friday nights. So there was things I noticed that seemed to be neglected. And what I saw mostly was a type of self-righteousness by faith in the conservative groups of Adventism. That's my human perspective. But it was based upon, to a large degree, what I, not so much what people were saying, but what they were doing, how they were acting, um, which is, of course, a little bit subjective. Because sometimes people could say the right words, but they definitely didn't act like they were converted. And I wasn't condemning them or judging them, you know, as, as a, in a critical spirit. I was just observing that there was, there was something amiss with the message of righteousness by faith. And this wasn't just in others. It was also in my own life. I recognized that there was a weakness uh, that existed. And I believe that that weakness was because of the lack of, prophetic understanding because most of the prophetic understanding in that history was really mixed up and we didn't have the slightest clue and that would be because the church had departed from the foundation of the message and so we had all kinds of different interpretations of prophecy now one of one of the biggest ones uh, for me that was a real difficult one to, to adjust to is, is, and I think it was Roy Allen Anderson who really put this 
promoted this idea and it, it influenced a lot of conservative Adventists. But if you were to look at the seven heads of Revelation 17, for instance, we would, we would agree upon Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome in both its pagan and papal forms. But what generally would people put as the sixth? Does anybody know? Because we put the United States, but what would people put as the sixth? Five of fallen one is. This new world order. Yeah, so they would put the, the sixth as being basically spiritualism, right? So, because France takes down the papacy, France now becomes the sixth. But we don't see it that way when we, when we apply uh, Revelation 17 in that way. We see that the United States arises in 1798. And of course, that's based on the spirit of prophecy. But you can see that there is these, these ideas that are floating around, all kinds of other things too, dealing with Daniel um, and Revelation 9 and uh, you know 8 and 9. How do we understand the trumpets? That was another really big thing. The trumpets were future. They, um, you know, different sorts of, of connection with the plagues and, and so forth. So, so all these different ideas were going around within conservative Adventism. And if you don't have a solid prophetic foundation, can you expect to have the strength to experience faith? Can your faith stand? Does it have anything solid upon which to rest? No. No. And that was the problem, I think, with, with the righteousness by faith, um, even though people could say the right things uh, to a large degree, uh, they didn't have a, a solid foundation. Now, if people who are professing to believe something aren't doing it, uh, what do we call that? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, right? So this is really the problem that exists not just with the church, but with, with everyone in Adventism. And it's going to be this prophetic foundation, once it's examined, that is going to allow us uh, to have the faith that we can proclaim a message, not just in word, but in deed, that we can be a demonstration of this righteousness, which is by faith. Now, of course, the sad reality is um, that within this movement, we, we still have this problem that is, and especially at 9-11, because mostly what we're looking at is the problems within the church, but not the problems within ourselves. And, and, and this was my experience in the movement for, to a large degree, is that I saw that people were focused upon the sins of others, um, but not their own sins. And this, this is what I saw on, on Sabbath morning here, just this past Sabbath in the study that was done. There was nothing about what we need to do, what we need to see in ourselves. It was really just about all those other sinners out there. That, that's my perspective. It's maybe a bit harsh, but that's what I saw in the Sabbath study. And, you know, I think that has to change in this movement. That we need to see that this message is to us, that we need to be reformed. But we always think about, you know, we're going to reform the Levites. You know, we're going to reform the church. But we ourselves are really devoid of any sort of spiritual discernment um, on one level. Right. So we we hardly understand the scriptures and yet we profess to believe things that we don't even understand. And and so that's something that has to change if God is going to use this movement. And we would be in unity. The, the, the sign that this is not the case is our lack of unity. 
And Heidi, have I been reading nine testimonies? And this is something that's quite predominant in, in parts of nine testimonies, dealing with the fact that, that we need to be united with our brethren, that this is the strongest evidence that God is working. And, uh, and it, it requires a Christ-like character to do that. So, so this message here, this prophetic message, is, is not a, a means unto itself. I mean, it's a means unto an end. God has a purpose, and this is a reform line. So when we look at, at this darkness and we look at this line, um, we're talking that this line here is addressing first this work of repentance that needs to occur, which we, we would, the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, if that's the case, why do we have ozone 2004 and Oklahoma 2010 as the formalization and the, the empowerment of this message? If it's a message of repentance, wouldn't we look at something else um, being the formalization of that message and the empowerment of it. Because what these are, these are, are steps in the understanding of 9-11 itself, right? So, so why are we not focused upon like the message of righteousness by faith or something like that that's being presented? Why are we focused upon these these camp meetings here? Because we need to understand the foundations much more clearly than what will come later. Because if we don't have a true foundation, we will never really understand the message of Revelation 14 and righteousness by faith. Yeah. So without the prophetic message, there really actually can't be repentance. So 9-11 comes to wake up Seventh-day Adventists. That's why it happened. Now, not all Adventists continue to uh, stay awake, right? Right. As I said, you know, yesterday, a lot of them just, you know, rolled over and went back to sleep. But some did wake up. And, um, you know, and this movement is part of that, because I believe there's other people who have, have woken up because of 9-11 and are still studying. But this movement had a, a special insight that it, a foundation that had already been laid. And that is the message of Jeff. Right. So this understanding that this parallels Millerite history is really important. Now, um, so I understood before uh, before 1989, for instance, that the Soviet Union was going to fall. And and I understood this from reading Lewis F. Weir. Um, but I wouldn't have I wouldn't have seen what Jeff saw is that 1989 was the time of the end. I didn't see the two times of the end that, that Jeff saw in that. But Jeff didn't see 9-11 coming, right? I mean, no one really did. I mean, there is a video by, I uh, can't think of his name, where he talks about, he reads from Testimonies 9, um, uh, where it talks about the great buildings in New York, and he says that these will fall down one day, and be the you know. So so he reads this. I wish I could remember the guy's name. Um, but uh, you know, a conservative preacher who preached that message prior to 9/11, but nobody really foresaw within the lines that we were looking for that type of an event. Now there is. Um, uh, a study that was done on the trumpets, but it might have, this study was done, I guess, after 9-11. Originally, I thought it might be before 9-11 because of the paper that it's put in. But um, we did have an understanding of the trumpets prior to 9-11. That is, this movement accepted the pioneers' understanding of the trumpets. 
And so we would know that there was a first and second woe and that the second woe ended on August 11th because Jeff is going to apply that to 1989. So prior to 9-11, he's going to take uh, Josiah Litch's prophecy and he's going to see, well, there's a parallel between 1989 and August 11th, 1840. So he's not going to parallel it um, 1989, even though he has it as the time of the end. He's going to parallel it with the empowerment of the first angel's message. Now, after 9-11, he's going to then move that over to uh, the empowerment of the first angel's message now in Millerite history is going to parallel 9-11. So it becomes the empowerment of the first angel's message. So we've studied into that and how those, those changes of the line came about. And of course, every time we, this movement received light, people who were in the movement left and people who weren't in the movement joined. So um, the ozone camp meeting as a formalization of this message prior to this, to a large degree, Jeff's ministry was um, him traveling around and speaking in different churches. So this, this camp meeting, so this is the first camp meeting they have. Um, they now have a type of organization, I guess you might call it, of the message. And they start to, they start having camp meetings. So as a formalization, it's putting this message together, but it's also addressing this 9-11, right? So the understanding of 9-11 is now being presented within this movement. So we, ha we have an understanding of 9-11 to a certain degree. It's going to develop, um, but that's what the ozone camp meeting represents. So this increase of knowledge is this study that comes from understanding 9-11, now, then for the empowerment, why do we place the Oklahoma 2010 camp meeting as an empowerment of that message, the, the prophetic chain? Because we, we still, we have defined this darkness in a certain way, a lack of prophetic understanding. Um, but why would that camp meeting be an empowerment? I mean, it's a big camp meeting. It's an important one. You know, I happen to be there on November 7th when it begins. I meet Jeff. So, but what else is there about 2010? Weren't almost all actions brought together at the time of that camp meeting right so all of the ministries are brought together now so the the guy that invited me uh, merit merit hurst lowell merit hurst is his full name I, I don't believe he's in any kind of connection with this movement at all now but some people might know more about him um but yeah, he um, he's the one that invited me and he organized the camp meeting. He paid for it, um, you know, rented the facility, invited all the speakers, um, everything that, you know, it was his organization of a camp meeting. And um, his his wife, uh, she did presentations in the morning on righteousness by faith. Um, and those types of presentations that she did, I've seen other times. Jeff was not really impressed uh, with these presentations. Um, we've seen some similar presentations in this movement, again, presenting the same ideas as righteousness by faith, which, which isn't. Um, and, and um, which, which I would generally call a type of uh, legalism. So people think that righteousness by faith is just that you overcome sin. And, you know, so you've got to do that and you've got to 
deal with all these little sins. And of course, that that is true, but that's not the root of righteousness by faith. Um, so I'm not going to go into that now. We're going to look at, at that more on the Friday uh, studies. But so this is one of the things that Jeff had to always deal with. The other was always these counterfeit health messages, too. So these two th things sort of um, were thorns in his side throughout this the history of this movement. And so this was happening at the Oklahoma camp meeting. And um, so we have all these ministries come together. And Jeff um, has, as, as we looked, we actually went to uh, the seventhunders.com website, um, which it no longer exists except at uh, the Wayback Machine. So you're going to see there was all together... 45 presentations and there uh, Jeff uh, Manuel Carrasco um, Emiliano and Jamal um, are going to be doing this prophetic chain so you got Jeff who who wrote the prophetic chain uh, he's going to have these other speakers presenting the prophetic chain so he's given them these assignments. So that's going to be Jamal, Jamal Emiliano, and Manuel Carrasco. The other speakers um, um, are going to do their own presentation. So Dario's going to do his own, uh, says Sister Hurst, that's Merritt's wife. Um, and Roland Temple, Te Roland Temple is going to do his own presentations. And Kevin Howard and... Um, also, uh, one presentation from Jimmy Villman. He's a Frenchman. He didn't know English very well, but he, he was entertaining. Actually, he did maybe three presentations, it says here. So there was these different presentations that were done by these different speakers, but the main part was the prophetic chain, and that ended up being 18 of the 45 presentations were on the prophetic chain. And... Um, and then Emiliano did one at the end was just sort of uh, his own presentation. And I know that was on the Sunday. And, and I feel that Jeff did one on the Sunday as well. Um, but I could be wrong about that. That's one thing I don't remember specifically. Um, so, so we had these, um, all these different speakers from all these different ministries. And what we're going to see is that these ministries are going to um, leave the movement on October 22nd, 1844. Or not 1844, October 22nd, 2014, right? So we can see that there becomes this closed door. And that's the way that I look at the camp meeting in Arkansas. But that's, but that's where we're going. So we're having this reform message in this movement. But when we get to this empowerment of this message this should have been a very uh powerful uniting force for this movement the oklahoma camp meeting but also at that camp meeting is going to arrive the second angel so what specifically then is the second angel the second angel's message why does it arrive at the same camp meeting What's the second angel's message? Second angel's message is to give glory to God. Okay. So it is to give glory to God. It's also Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Right. Okay. Correct. Okay. So, so here we had the opportunity. This movement had the opportunity to give glory to God and to be called out of Babylon in, in a symbolic sense here. Um, but the movement is not going to, um, it's not going to really be benefited. Many people in the movement aren't going to be benefited by this message because at this same time is the stirrings against Jeff and the idea that Jeff needs to accept their message. So we know 
from Jamal's letter that if we go back to o Oklahoma, this is where this dissatisfaction with Jeff arises, that his kingly power has, has been exercised. So they're interpreting Jeff's inclusiveness, his call for unity as kingly power. And so this is going to be um, developing in this sort of undercurrent of dissatisfaction with Jeff. And it's going to manifest itself ultimately in 2014. Now, there are other camp meetings that happened, you know, that we could mark uh, different events as we move ahead. But when we get to Oklahoma and, we, and we're now going to mark Ehud there, we're going to see that Ehud, um, when we look in the, in the story of Judges chapter 3, that this is going to be primarily, primarily a message about the 2520. So you have um, this sort of Babylonian captivity under the first message under Othniel, right? So you have the king of Mesopotamia, you have these two evils um, that need to be addressed. And, and what would those two evils be? If, you know, within this movement, what is it? Isn't one of them our willfulness to ignore the word of God? Yeah. So we know that this, this king, his name means twice wicked, right? Correct. Twice wicked, wicked uh, Kushan, right? And so the words there, we have this um, Kushan. It's a r region of Arabia. But we have this word Risha, which means wickedness, and it's in the dual plural, so it's twice wickedness. And and so we have, so you're saying they are, the two are which? The two evils that this movement has to overcome? Well, I said at least one of them is our willfulness to set aside the word of God and not walk according to what it truly says. Yeah, so every man's doing what's right in his own eyes. Right. And, and I would say part of it is this lack of unity that comes from this critical spirit. That is. I would agree to that. Yeah. Okay. So we're critical of the church, but we're also critical within. Right? We're critical of each other. And... So, so we're, we're doing what's right in our own eyes. So we need repentance from that. And there is also a rejection of the word of God. Right. Which, which has to do with the prophetic message. So it's a rejection of the foundation of this message and, and how to study God's word. So 9-11 wakes us up to the fact that one is we didn't see 9-11 coming. And if we were good students of prophecy, wouldn't we have seen 9-11 coming? Yes. Yeah. So, so we get blindsided. And that should be an indication that we don't understand Bible prophecy, that we've missed something. And that in this movement, because Jeff had been studying Millerite history, he's now able to to appreciate what 9-11 meant as far as a line is concerned on how we're repeating Millerite history. So it already fit into the st structure he was um, unfolding, that the Holy Spirit had been unfolding. So, so in order to be benefited by, in order to receive the second message, you have to be benefited by the first. So we can see that uh, these... In the Oklahoma camp meeting, we have 
and we're going to see this once we get to 2014, that one is people haven't abandoned their their in way that they interpret prophecy, right? Because they're going to hold on to their interpretations of Joel. And also that they're not going to abandon that critical spirit. Right? This is just going to grow and manifest in what happens in 2014. So, so we look at Ehud and and we can see that this is this message of the 2520. Now, the 2520 has been there for a while, but um, that we're under this oppression, right? So, so this is going to more specifically address the prophetic message that we're under. And so we, we know that this is, um, you know, that Ammon and Amalek, they're going to possess the city of the palm trees that is Jericho, which is a symbol of the 2520. And that the children of Israel are going to serve the king of Moab, Agalon, for 18 years. And there's lots of symbolism in 18 years, and we're going to come back to that at some other point. Um, but uh, um, we also know that there is this this whole situation with Gilgal and Gilgal represents uh, the message of the sanctuary, right? It's going to mention, it's going to represent 9-11 as well. Um, but that's where the, the sanctuary was, was in Gilgal after they crossed the Jordan. And uh, there's going to be this idolatry that's there. Um, and then he's, um, Ehud is going to kill this king of, of, of Moab, Eglon, and, uh with this sort of uh, pretension regarding that he's going to give him a present, right? And there is this um, uh, where he goes to these quarries, that's where the idols are made. And so quarries is the same word for idolatry that are by Gilgal, and he's going to return, right? So he's going to return. He's going to have this message, and he's going to uh, put this sword, or this says a dagger in the King James, but he's going to put this into his, uh, in, into the belly of Ehud, or of Eglon, pardon me. Ehud's going to do that. And then this blade's going to go in, and the handle is going to be closed up in this fat guy. So whatever that symbols mean, I'm not sure. Um, but there's this whole situation with the servants and so forth that we're not going to look, look at right now. But we do know um, that Ehud, when he escaped, while they tarried, so there's a tarrying there. And he, it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them. So we can look at this, this blowing of the trumpet um, is a specific message, right? And, and what we've done here with this line is we said, well, this is Ehud, but we're not doing the separate line of Ehud yet. We will. But in this line, this is the message of the 2520. And the formalization of that message we're going to look at is April 27th, 2012. That's Jeff. Um, I think that's a Friday. Uh, he's going to be at Newport. Um, now, this is after the disfellowship has happened. Correct, Dwight? Some people have been disfellowshipped already. Correct. Yeah. And um, so he's not presenting at the Newport Church. Uh, um, he's presenting in Newport. And so this is um, a formalization of the message of the 2520. This is where the 2520 now. Um, now, we could say, well, why don't we have the second angel being where the 2520 arrives? But if we looked at the message, of, if we looked at a line of Ehud, we would have that in that line. But this is a bigger line. And then we're going to have the two tables. And that's June 22nd that they're first posted on YouTube. 
2012. It's going to be that same year that we have this um, empowerment of this message. Now, in the two tables, Jeff is going to present um, what I would call the prophetic mirror, but is he's going to present something that he didn't really present, I don't think, clearly before this. Um, and that's that's the the whole period from 742 to 1863 in a much, much clearer way as a mirror itself. So he's not just putting the two 2520s together and seeing, you know, uh, um, 723 to 1844. He's putting those periods at the beginning at the end and and that whole mirror then is going to be a mirror that is um 2604 years in length which we're not going to know that um at that time and and I, I know that i didn't figure that out until 2013 and that was a study uh, i gave the study at collins place in 2013 um, and uh, Colin had figured out the same thing the week before, so which which was kind of interesting. So I'm pretty sure it was late 2013. But anyway, so this whole prophetic mirror that's going to be in the two tables. But there's lots of things. So the two tables, uh, why would we put them as the empowerment of the second angel? Because without them, we would never come to the message of the third. Okay, right. So Jeff is laying down that whole foundation of everything that has happened. And now he's presenting a message that needs to be accepted. So the people in 2010 are being tested by a message that we could say is the prophetic chain. And, and Jeff is going to lay this all out in these presentations that he's going to finish in 2013, um, but he starts in 2012. But that message, as Jeff is laying out that message, we have a whole group of people who are seeking to undermine what Jeff is doing. Now, it's interesting that part of the two tables presentations, so Jeff was doing this in the mornings. Um, um, I think they had actually moved to uh, in 2012 to the building that's on the property where the School of the Prophets are. Um, it was the one that Heidi and I stayed in when we were there in 2016. Um, so it was in that building, that living room where they had set up to do these meetings. And I believe that's where the two tables was uh, being live streamed from. So we watched it online. I watched it on live stream. And, um, but Emiliano was supposed to present, and this is in 2013, uh, but he ends up uh, not presenting because he's so sick. But it was during this time that he came to see um, the message of Ezra 7-9. Right, so the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month. So why would that be significant that this, this happens in connection with the, the two tables? He doesn't end up presenting it. But what's happening here in, in this history in 2012 that... Uh, We know there's lots of other things that are happening. Parminder is going to make his prediction. Uh, but about 2014, which really is about the separation of the movement, not the Sunday law. But we know 2014 is the Sunday law, right? So if we think about it here, um, we can see that we can go, um, we can take this as, you know, Oklahoma is the first day of the first month. Right? Newport is the fifth day of the fourth month. That's midnight. Right. 
and, and midnight in the experience, you know, with the persecution that happens with the 2520. And, and, and we don't res necessarily need these dates. We could just talk about the events of Newport and the events of the two tables and what's happening. Um, and then you're going to have um, uh, the two tables, which is really the proclamation of a message. That's the midnight cry message in this line, right? But that's going to be rejected. So we know that when 2014 comes, we have the great disappointment for this movement in that context, right, of this line. And it was pretty discouraging for a lot of people what happened in 2014. You know, especially for the people like me who didn't really know what was going on. I mean, we, we had the signs of it. We could see it afterwards because uh, we did. I mean, I saw right from Oklahoma, I saw the grumblings with Jeff, you know, about Jeff and and all through this history, you know, my contacts with people in the movement, these ministries, there seemed to be an underlying resentment. But much easier to see in retrospect than to see at the time. So when we get to uh, the Wednesday, October 22nd, so I just choose that it's the midst of the week um, of these presentations of Jeff, the people from these ministries would have been speaking at this camp meeting and, and, and they would have been speaking at uh, uh, the one also in June. But because of what had happened prior to that, uh, they're not going to be speaking at these camp meetings. So, so, and Jeff is going to give a much more specific message because in June 22nd, um, this was just unfolding behind the scenes, uh, the separation. I can't remember when I first heard about it, but I'm pretty sure it was... Um, it wasn't until like probably July that I heard about what had happened in the movement. And because um, it would have been at the camp meeting we had, which I think was in July, the end of July. And then, um, so then this camp meeting, Jeff was at our camp meeting in 2014 uh, in July in Alberta. And then he invited me to speak at this camp meeting in Arkansas and present on chronology. So, so we have this message introduced here. So it's a third angel message arriving. But within this bigger line, we can see why this is important um, and, the, and the role that this plays. So um, right in this bigger line here, we're going to see I have from 2005 to 2014. You know, I could have put 2004 there, I guess. But I'm just dealing with Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. They're, they're representing this history in this movement. But then we're going to see that they're going to, this chronology and this understanding is going to lead to a, a further unfolding of light, which we're going to mark in 2018. So on this bigger line, we can see how Othniel, Othniel, Uhud, and Shamgar represent this arrival of the first message. But it is a reform line in and of itself, right? Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. So, um, so I think that's a good review of, of that line. Any, any comments about it? Because remember, this darkness here that it's addressed in this first way mark is also addressed in this line. So the darkness here is, is still going to continue. That is, we still have a reform line. And that's one way that we can see that in a reform line, darkness continues. Right? Darkness and, and the increase of light continues. Right. So you, you have a time of the end, whatever that is, and, and then you're going, but before that you have a period of darkness. 
and that time of the end is going to be the arrival of a message. And you have the increase of light, but the increase of light doesn't just occur here. It occur occurs all along, and especially with the arrival of a next message, you're going to have a, a massive increase of light. You know, and we put this arrow up like this, but, you know, in some ways it probably goes like this as an arc. And then you get uh, a massive increase of light again and a massive increase of light again, but it, it d diminishes to some degree. Right, because people are going to reject light as well. So, so there's this light that's being received under the first message. But, you know, the work of the enemies is going to happen and so forth. And so when you get uh, to the arrival of the second angel, uh, people have been weeded out, so to speak. People have rejected this light. And so the next group of people is going to receive, because they've, they've benefited by, by the first message, they're now going to be able to receive the second message. And then that's going to give an increase of light. Now, and you can see in this judge's line, I mean, we definitely had an increase of light in this history leading up to July 18, 2020. And, and then we're going to have an increase of light that happens after July 18, 2020. That's uh, been what we've been experiencing in these studies. Um, but there is a rejection of light that occurs. And so when we got to January 11th, 2023, um, we're now in another period in which there's going to be another message arriving, what we call the third. And we would expect an increase of light, but only those that are benefited by the light that has come are going to be benefited by the light that's coming now. Right. So we're in this period of time where this light, this third message has arrived in how we've drawn out this line. So that's how we've done it. Um, but again, we look at each of these waymarks and we have a reform line. So if we go back here now, um, and we were gonna create another reform line. So I'm just gonna do this. Now, this isn't going to be as easy as you think, or it's not going to work out exactly as you think, because now, now we're going to say that this is a reform line of Othniel. So I'm just going to make Othniel's reform line. So now we have Othniel, and so we're going to be a bit more specific. Now, this message of Othniel it's going to have all of these waymarks, the first, second, and third. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit, right? So Othniel doesn't represent a person, represents um, a specific work. Now, where would the line of Othniel begin? What would be the darkness and what would be the arrival of the first angel? Would we just start off Neil at 9-11? Because we say Othniel arrives at 9-11 on this line of Othniel, Uhud, and Shamgar. So we're we just going to have Othniel arrive at 9-11. I would think that Othniel would need to arrive a bit before 9-11. Okay. Right. So, so we put Othniel at, not at, at that, but we know when we've done other lines and we have, a, we have a bigger line above it, that the first angel can commence prior to that. That is that, that way mark of that first angel's message. For instance, in Millerite history, you know, we have 1798, but we begin Miller's personal line. Um, when he's born, right? I mean, obviously, it can't start before he's born. Before he's born is darkness for him personally. 
So he's going to have this personal reform line. And, and it's going to be on his uh, 16th birthday that he's going to receive. Well, we don't know if he receives his concordance, but in that year, when he's 16, we assume it's, it's probably on his 16th birthday. But on his 16th birthday, the Pope, Pius VI, is going to be taken captive by Berthier, right? So he receives a very interesting birthday present there. Um, I don't know how many of you have had a Pope taken captive for your birthday when you turned 16, but that's what Miller had happened to him, right? And that's going to mark the time of the end. So, so we can see that his reform line begins earlier. So this work of the Holy Spirit, Spirit has to begin prior. Now, remember, one of the things we look at about 9-11 is it's the first sprinklings of the latter rain, right? That's how Jeff looked at 9-11. But if we're going to look at this work of repentance, um, could we start Othniel's line back in 1989? Could we go all the way back there? Could we see that, that this is a reform line that brings us from 1989 to 9-11? Yes. Okay. So that's the way that I would look at this line. And so if I'm going to look at Othniel and put it on a line, I'm going to put the third angel arrives is actually 9-11. That's, that's the way that I would do it. Even though Othniel is representing that first angel's message arriving at 9-11, this work of the Holy Spirit that is occurring is, well, at, at least it has to start at 1989. Now, there's lots of things regarding this, this line of Othniel because it's it's different than just Jeff being there, right? So it's it's not the line of Jeff, right? Because Jeff has his own reform line as well. But it's showing us that that nine eleven is the result of the work of the Holy Spirit, and 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 when nine eleven arrives. As the empowerment of the first angel's message, it's also because uh, this is on a, a, the bigger line right above. Nine eleven is also this work of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit, in a sense, arrives at nine eleven with the first sprinklings of the latter rain. And so all the things we said about that darkness, you know, the, the double wickedness, what it is, well, it's true also of those people who end up coming into this movement in the first place, right? That is, for the most part, we're Seventh-day Adventists. Now, we don't all come in at 9-11 specifically to this movement, but 9-11 may wake us up so that we can come into this movement. So the, the arrival of 9-11, this work of the Holy Spirit that happened with 9-11, um, has happened to people who come into the movement, especially after 9-11. So this is consistent with how we have looked at the other reform lines in the Old Testament, right? Agreed. Okay. Now, as far as all these different waymarks, I mean, um, if, we, if we're addressing this period of darkness, it has to do with the prophetic message. Now, we might even start this to some degree even before, nine, before 1989, because, you know, there's different ways you could take this work of the Holy Spirit. You could even take this whole line of Othniel and reach it back uh, to Millerite history if you wanted to. So there are different ways that we could take this line of Othniel, but it is a reform line that addresses, um, we would say, I guess the way that we're looking at it is the critical spirit, 
right? The disunity that exists that has destroyed God's church. So it's, it's really a rejection of righteousness by faith. Correct. Okay. And, um, and, and then also the prophetic message. Now, I mean, we can see how there is this um, progressive destruction of four within Adventism, the four generations. And so we look at while well, a reform line happens in a period of darkness. And so, you know, the period of darkness before 1989 is a period of darkness. But when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit here, the Holy Spirit has been working all through this history. And the Holy Spirit is working through this history to lead us up to 9-11, right? So could the work of Othniel here, could we reach it back as something that, bri that bridges um, Millerite history and our history, that a work, a work of the Holy Spirit that's going through throughout this history? Is, is it possible we could do that with Othniel? So if we look it, at Othniel, again. It is, it is possible. Okay, it is possible. Okay, so if we were to look at Othniel again. So we know that there's two things. They're serving Balaam and the groves. Now, now what's the difference here? I mean, we have these two. Two false worships, so Asherim and Balaam. I mean, what's the difference? Why they did, why do they go together here? So, so these are the two evils, right? Well, just just like what we've seen in the study with Elijah, mm -hmm. isn't this showing the totality of the apostasy? Yeah, so it's showing the totality. But um, if we look at, and I shouldn't say but, I mean, yes, it's true. But if, if we are going to look at Balaam and the groves, what's the difference between them? And because even Balaam, you know, is in the dual form for some reason. But uh, um, it's Baal, right? So they're going to, um, so it's, it, plural is Balaam, occurs 81 times in the Bible, in the King James, anyway. Balaam does, or Baal does. And then you have Asherah. So this is, we have a male and a female god, basically, right? Asha is a Phoenician goddess. Right. So it's kind of like nature. Right. Okay. I'm just having to consider what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm considering it too. Um, but the thing is, we have these double, this double. So the, the, and, and now they're going to be, because of serving these two things, they're going to be under the oppression of a king whose name means the two evils of Cush, right? But in, in this, in this kind of a situation, if we bring this down to, our time right now is this not also a symbol of the rejection of the bible just as it reads and of the spirit of prophecy okay so so it's a rejection of the bible and the spirit of prophecy and it's an acceptance of the gods of you know 
of this world, which is man's own understanding. Right. Yeah. So however we want to understand this, I mean, these, these are pretty broad sort of symbols. But within Adventism, we have had um, the Protestant understanding of scripture and spiritualism, you know, as a subcurrent that exists within those in Adventism who are not converted, right? So this manifests itself in lots of different ways. So this oppression is going to happen. And it's going to be a period of 18 years. So they were being brought to midnight. Okay. Well, yeah, I know you want to use 18 as midnight. And I don't know if I would use it here. Just because there isn't, um, I mean, you have the doubling and things like that, but it's just where I'm putting it in the line because midnight is also the cross. And I mean, maybe that's what you're trying to say. Well, that's a, a, a deeper symbol, yes. But they're being, they're, they're being shown that they have come to a point of apostasy that they cannot depend upon themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, another symbol here. So 18 years is a symbol of the Sunday law. Um, that is, 18 years is 216 months, right? And 18 years, of course, is uh, six plus six plus six, right? Correct. Okay. So just like 36 can be a symbol of 666, 18 can also represent that. Now we have, um, you know, so as far as the Sunday law, we know that our line is about the Sunday law and we have the Sunday law arrive at 9-11. If we understand that our line, specifically 9-11, is the mighty angel of Revelation 18 and Ellen White places that at the Sunday law. So we can see that our line is a zoom into the Sunday law of Ellen White's line. So, so that would support the idea that, that, this, that there's this 18 years of oppression um, and then Othniel comes as a judge. So that would fit in the idea with how we've put it in our line. Now, we also, though, have Millerite history. And, you know, if we were going to reach this back to Millerite history, if we're going to look at Othniel, um, if this 18 represents the Sunday law, we could even look at it as representing October 22nd, 1844, or even just 1844 in general. Okay. All right. So that's one way we could look at it. Now, um, so this is a little bit tricky, but um, when we look at um, at this this line, so I'm just going to go back to this line here. So we're going to just take this line of Othniel, Uhud, and Shamgar. This is going to go up to 2014. Now, 2014 is uh, 216 years from 1798, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, it's also interesting that if I take 18 years, so I can create two 
216, so I can go from 1798, 216. I can also just take 18 years times 360. And this is gonna give me the number 6,480. And 6,480, if I divide it by 30, it's going, oh, it's gonna give me 216. I already did that calculation. Uh, yeah, so, so it's gonna give me 216 both ways. That's just another way of doing the same thing. Um, so there was something else. Okay, never mind. So that's just do two different ways that I can come to 216. Um, and 216 brings me to 214 or 2014. <coughs> Correct? Correct. Yeah, so 2014 becomes significant here in that context of the line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. But if this brings me back to the time of the end, I mean, I could say that Othniel just represents the work of the Holy Spirit at the time of the end. And that could be 1798, and that could be 1989. So Othniel represents the work of the arrival of the first angel on any line. But so we can so we can connect this all the way back to 1798 if we wanted to. So so the line of Othniel could be expanded to it to, to span other lines. But he also represents the arrival of the third angel. In a sense, Othniel is going to represent um, the whole idea of what a reform line is, which is the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Right. Okay. <clears throat> And um, now his, his name means the force of God or the line of God, right? Okay, agreed. Okay. And, um, and this is in contrast to Balaam and the groves. Because this is the power of man. Right? Balaam in the groves and Asherah. Balaam and Asherah. Right. Okay. Now, it's also a mixture of church and state, too. Right? So the male and the female, male representing the state, the female, the church. So, in other words, it's representing an unholy covenant relationship. Yeah. And, and so that, you know, I mean, there's lots here too, Othniel, in, in the broad spectrum of things. Now, within our line, within our history, we can see that the work of Othniel is representing 9-11. But not, Othniel has a reform line. I don't know if we necessarily need to go through and define what each of these waymarks are for Othniel. I mean, we probably could. But I think, you know, for this study, this is probably significant enough to understand what Othniel is, that he is representative of a reform line. And we see that with the first angel's message, because the first angel's message encompasses all of the, the lines. And this is always the work of the Holy Spirit. A reform line is the work of the Holy Spirit. To revive us, right? Because that's the first thing is you can't have a reformation without a revival. Revival brings about reformation. Reformation doesn't bring about revival. Correct? Exactly. Lots of people try to put the reformation first. But it's the revival that comes first. You have to awaken. You have to come to life. 
Okay, well, our time is up for today. So we've we've examined some things further and we're taking our time here because this is going to be a message that's gonna be presented this summer at, uh, at our camp meeting in July. So, so we want to go through this and, and be able to draw these lines out and formulate them and understand them and be able to explain them. Because whether you're there at the camp meeting or not, you need to be able to share this with others. But even if, even if it's being presented at the camp meeting, people need to understand it prior to the camp meeting. But anyway, uh, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today and for the way that you lead and guide us. May your Holy Spirit continue its work upon our hearts in repentance and confession of sins. And also, Lord, that we can be strengthened and reformed, that we can represent you in, in all ways. Be with each person, watch over us, bring us together again to study your word is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.